So I'll start this video off with a little bit of an introduction. If you guys look on the left side of the screen there, you'll see a crazy guy jumping up and down, waving his arms, screaming, pointing, right there, that's me. Or in this clip here, pacing from left, back to right, back left, looking at the scoreboard, assessing the foul situation, that's also me. About a year ago, I quit my job in finance to do something I was a bit more passionate about. Not that I don't love holding two phones to my head like that guy, I just felt it was a bit unsustainable for a career path. What I really wanted to be doing was working in basketball, and specifically, coaching basketball. And yes, I swear I didn't throw any chairs across the floor like that. Now, I did have some experience coaching. I worked as a student assistant for Dickinson College, helping out with scouting, player development, and analytics. And yes, there I am, the smallest and most unathletic looking one. But I will show you guys my highlight tape. Focus your attention to the bottom right hand side of the screen and you see who the first one off the bench is. Slow it down here so we can do a little bit of a breakdown. Dribble drive, pull up, gets blocked, loose ball situation. We pick it up, we score it. This is to send us to the Sweet 16. And just look at the quickness and the agility off the bench. First one there and sidestep the ref, get around him, clean, no touch. And after that, just jumping around like a madman, fist bumping looking for anybody to embrace. Some things don't change. And I think I really missed this feeling and wanted it back somehow. So I reached out to the head coach of a local high school program, asking if I could be his assistant. We hit it off almost immediately, bonding over how bad the Knicks were. The next thing I knew, I was on the staff. Now, this program wasn't exactly a juggernaut. I mean, we've really, really struggled over the years. Here's the standings from the year prior, and here's the standings from the year prior to that and the standings from the year prior to that, and the year prior to that, so you get the point. But this isn't a video about another losing season. It's about how through some minor adjustments in our offensive tactics and strategy, we were able to have the first winning season in over a decade, qualify for both our New England and league playoffs for the first time in 25 years, and beat some of our most important league rivals for the first time probably literally since the Stone Age. We also had some pretty cool locker room celebrations like this. Anyway, Hope you guys enjoy the video and really appreciate you watching. All right, so we had a little bit of fun there in the introduction and I wanted to put this disclaimer in there for all the non-basketball nerds. This next 13 minutes is gonna be pretty heavy in terms of statistical analysis and film breakdown. So if you just came in to tune in for the introduction, I would advise and would not be upset if you turned it off right now. For all the nerds, this is probably what you're watching for anyway. So here's some quantifiable differences between last season and this season. It's easy to say that we got better, but it's more important to say how much better. So points per game starting off a 10-point differential. And it can be a little bit of a noisy stat because of pace and possessions a game. I understand that. But even when you boil it down to a more granular level to the points per possession, basically a 20% increase um, in that stat. And then two really relevant stats here are the three-point attempts per game, eight more, and the threes made 50 more. And note that was in five less games due to some cancellations that we had. All of that leads into an effective field goal percentage that was 10 percentage points higher than we had in the previous year. And also note that this improvement was with the same guys that we had in the previous year, which I'll speak to in some of the clips that we break down. It wasn't like we brought in a bunch of five-star guys and all of a sudden our offense exploded. It's really a testament to these guys and buying into what we wanted them to do. So here's a comparison in the shot charts from last season and this season. On the top is the previous year and the bottom is this year. And there's a couple things I want to call out, starting with the number of threes that we're taking and where we're taking them from. So this season we took a lot more threes, obviously, but also took a lot more from the corner and the wing specifically. And we found those to be more drive and kick scenarios, where last season we were taking a lot from the top of the key, which were more isolation scenarios. The second thing is the lack of mid-range shots that we took. So last year there were some spots where we had 25 attempts, 33, 27. This year we didn't have one spot over 20. And the last thing is the efficiency at the rim, which can be attributed to the way that we space the floor and therefore the lack of rim protection. You'll see a big difference in the field goal attempts. That was because we had a lot of cancellations this year due to COVID. Um, and so that explains that difference. Here we'll go over some clips about how we spaced the floor last year and compared it to this year. All right, so to the film room we go. Here's a clip from last year and a prime example of how we got ourselves into a little bit of trouble with the way that we spaced the floor. So we start off okay. Uh, corners filled, slots filled, ball handler in the high slot. The biggest issue here is right in the mid post, we got a guy sitting, and then obviously the defender sitting on his back um, where that arrow is right there. Now, we rarely, if ever, threw the ball into the post. 
we didn't really have a dominant post presence. And so we found these to be tough contested twos at the rim as well as we really weren't generating fouls out of the situation, so weren't getting to the free throw line either. So all that's happening here is driving lanes are being clogged up by the fact that he's sitting there and his defender's sitting there as well. So as I run this clip, you'll see Charlie beats his man initially, but it's actually Danny's man, the one sitting in the middle of the post. It's allowed to help off of him and make this a tough contested two at the rim that we unfortunately miss. All right, so again from last year, here's the next clip. Uh, this one is a bit painful to watch, especially for basketball nerds, so if you cover your eyes, it's okay. Um, right off the bat, it's going to be really tough. Right here, we got two of our guys sitting in the middle of the paint and two of their guys sitting in the middle of the paint. It's like a Suez Canal blockage or something in there. Um, Charlie could go left, he could go right, he could get by his man ten times in a row. There's no scenario in which he gets to the rim cleanly, either for himself or to create for others because of the way that the floor is spaced. Now... If we were running a stack pick and roll, maybe that would be a look that we would have, but we surely were not doing that in this scenario. So here we would kick one of these guys out to the corners, kick another one out to the wing to open things up a little bit. But again, this is last year, and out of this we get a long two, which my guys know gives me nightmares, and I wake up in cold sweats if we take these. So fast forward to this year, and this is a great clip to illustrate some of the adjustments that we made to our spacing. So on the catch here as we freeze it, we did basically everything offensively out of five out sets. So what that looks like here, corners are filled, slots are filled, and then this trailer at the top of the key is the biggest adjustment. So as you see the paint here, nobody in there compared to the previous clips where we had two, three, four bodies in there. Now there's nobody. Why we like doing that was to open up driving lanes for our guys to get downhill, to create more threes on drive and kick scenarios, and to make the reads much more simple. It was difficult for defenders to get over and help at the rim and also be able to contest out to three. So as I run this clip here, AJ finds Nas, Nas finds Charlie. As Charlie gets downhill, again, the read is pretty straightforward. If the guy in the corner who's guarding AJ steps over and helps at the rim, he's gonna kick it to AJ. If he doesn't, he'll go all the way to the rim and finish. In this case, the defender hard shows, slides all the way over, and it's a shooting practice three for AJ. Another great spacing clip here, again from this year. And this is against one of our arch rivals, St. Luke's. Hasn't been much of an arch rivalry as we have not beat them in over a decade until this year. So again, check the spacing out, right? Nobody in the paint. The corners are filled. Charlie's going to set an away screen. And as Carson catches the ball and rips downhill, the paint is wide open for him. The read is going to be pretty straightforward again. If that low man where the arrow is pointing steps over to contest at the rim, it's going to be a kick out to AJ like we saw in the last clip. And if he doesn't, we're going to get all the way to the rim for a finish. In this case, he rotates over, except for it's a bit late, and Carson gets there for an N1. A couple possessions later here in the same game, and it's a really similar scenario to the one I just showed before. As we're getting across half and running our stuff, AJ finds himself attacking a closeout and getting downhill. And again, I just wanted to highlight the spacing here and how good it is. Check out the corners, high slot, and as Charlie is cutting through, bringing his man with him, that's going to open up the paint for any drives and any downhill attacks. So as AJ catches, it's a decisive move, and we're just reading that low guy as we showed in the previous two clips. If he steps over, we're going to kick it. If he doesn't, we're going all the way to the rim. In this case, again, he's a bit late on the rotation or doesn't even really rotate at all, and we get a finger roll right at the front of the rim. Last clip for this segment, and wanted to save this one to show last because I think it's the perfect encapsulation of how we space the floor and how that allowed our ball handlers and our downhill guys to be creative with their dribble and not have to worry about seeing extra bodies in the paint. So starting off on the weak side here, running a little dummy action for one of our shooters, Charlie, to come off a down screen. And look what that does to the defense, right? You have three white jerseys, and not one of them is actually looking at the basketball. We see a lot of backs of heads. In the corner here, we have Carson spacing out, knowing where he needs to be for any drive and kick scenario. And that creates, from basically the lane line to the volleyball line, this huge area for Nas to be creative with a live dribble in. And that's just a really tough ask for any defender. And in this case, Nas is one of our better downhill creators and scorers. And here he gets all the way to the rim. Unfortunately, misses the layup, but that's a shot that we'll take every time. So we just went over how the improvements in our spacing opened up driving lanes for guys, made drive and kick scenario reads a little bit easier, and ultimately led to less contests at the rim. 
And we can see how that bears out in the numbers from last year to this year, specifically in the shot chart here at the rim. Last year, we were 43% and 46% respectively. This year, we bumped that up to 51% and 57%. In this chapter, I'm going to talk about how we reduced the amount of long twos that we were taking this year and turned those into threes, threes, and more threes, and why we felt that was the most effective way to become a more efficient offense. So here is a chart of some of our leading scores from last year on the far left column, 21, 2, and 3, and their field goal percentage from 2 and from 3 as well. We can do some simple expected value calculations here. And on the far right column in red, quickly see that every time that those guys were taking threes, they were really high value shots from us. So 38%, 40%, and 42% across the board. That's elite level shooting at the high school level. We realized we need to get up a lot more threes. And one way to do that was take out the number of long twos that we were taking last year. So here's some clips of some shots that we were taking last year. So you guys will notice a common thread in all of these clips, and I'm not going to break down all of them in excruciating detail. Just wanted to compile a couple just to show you guys and illustrate sort of the shots that we were taking and settling for. And all of them, you know, they're mostly off the dribble in isolation scenarios or off of one pass. They're almost always contested by at least one or two people. And most importantly, they're worth two points. So in all of these situations, we're taking long contested twos, which is just not the sign of an efficient offense. Skip ahead to this year, and we want to encourage our guys to take a lot more threes. Now, not every three you're gonna get is as open as some of the ones that I showed in sort of the previous spacing clips on the catch and shoots. We wanted to make sure that we were taking not only the open ones, but the semi to fully contested ones as well. So in these clips I'm showing here, these are not shooting practice threes. These are some with the hand in the face, with two hands in the face with the defender running at you, leaning to the left here at the side of bounds play on this one. These are not easy shots, but we figured that if we could get somewhere up from 30 shots to 33 shots from three a game, that we were gonna make somewhere between 10 to 12 on average based on the numbers that we calculated. And if we did that, we'd put ourselves in a really good spot to score and win games by the way that we defended on the other end. So the last segment here is a little bit of an overlap between the improvements in the spacing and the improvements in the shot selection. Um, going over a lot of the film from last year, I felt like we were getting to the right spots in terms of getting into the paint, creating off the dribble for ourselves. But when it got to that conflict point, we were often making the wrong decision on what we should be doing. So here's a perfect example. As Nas is going, beating his man, has a good angle to the rim. He should be reading that low guy, as we've talked about in the previous segments. If he steps over, we should be looking to hit Carson, and if he doesn't, we should get it all the way to the rim. Here, as he's getting downhill, that low guy all the way commits over, leaving Carson wide open in the corner for the baseline drift. The read here for Nas should be a kick to the corner, and as we've talked about, Carson's a 40% three-point shooter. This is a wide open shooting practice three. So instead of an open three in this scenario, we get a contested two at the rim that we ultimately miss. Another cut from last year, this off a high ball screen scenario, getting downhill into the paint, reading that low guy. And again, it's just the wrong read, right? He commits all the way over. The spacing isn't bad. Should be a kick to the corner. Instead, we try to go up with it and we get blocked not once, but twice. Final one I'm showing from last year, idea is basically the same. And again, this is just to highlight some of the issues and the reads that we were making. So as Nas catches the ball on the wing, he's thinking about it for a little bit, but ultimately decides to attack the basket as he should. And again, we're just reading that conflict defender and it's the wrong read. Right again, we have the kick to the open guy in the corner here. It's Carson again. Instead, we take a contested two over length. Here's some stuff from this year. And it's just a world of difference when you compare it to the stuff that we were doing the previous year. And I actually chose some of these clips specifically because it's actually some of the same kids in these situations that I showed previously. But this time, they're making the right reads. And that just goes to show the improvement that you can have in one year through film study, through buy-in. And at the end of the day, it's just a testament to these guys for executing it on the floor. So here again, as Nas is driving, reading this low guy as he steps over, Carson knows exactly where he should be going, and it's that corner. Nas hits him this time, we get a wide open three, and of course he's knocking that down more often than not. Pushing in transition here, and again, because our spacing is so good, the reads are pretty simple. Look how spread out our guys are, and therefore how spread out the defense is. Paint is wide open, so as Nas is going, again, we're just reading that low guy, finding Carson in the corner, Nas hits him, and again, an open three that we'll take.
This is my favorite clip of the year and the one we'll end on. Just look at the shots that we pass up to ultimately get a wide open three here. So last year, Nas is coming off this. He probably takes that mid-range shot. Instead, this time he kicks it out. Charlie drives it, kicks it to Carson again in the corner and another wide open three for us. That's it for the film breakdown for now. Hope these clips were able to accurately demonstrate how improvements in our spacing, our shot selection, and our reads on drive and kick scenarios really opened up things for our offense and made us much more efficient. I did want to give a special shout out to the head coach of the program, Nate Jean Baptiste, for letting my crazy ass on the staff um, and allowing me to be a part of this journey. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in and is watching. And keep your eyes peeled for the channel. I'll probably put out a uh, defensive compilation of some adjustments we made on that end and the improvements we made on that end as well. And look at the active hands by coach here in that clip, right? That doesn't go unnoticed. All right, guys, signing off. See you later.